It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the BenQ PD2705Q. As usual, there's a full written review accompanying this video, and you can find a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. If you're a bit short on time, there's also a quick video review, or a mini review if you prefer, and there's a link to that in the description of the video as well. As usual for a video, what you see depends on my camera. It depends on the processing done by my video editing software, it depends on the processing done by YouTube, and ultimately, and very importantly, it depends on the screen you're actually viewing the video on. So in no way does it accurately represent what the monitor actually looks like firsthand. This monitor uses a 27-inch LG IPS display and it has a 2560 by 1440 WQHD resolution. This resolution is good in terms of pixel density and desktop real estate for many users, so it's a kind of comfortable level in that respect. So you get a good amount of workspace and it's good for multitasking. Of course, not as many pixels or as much of a workspace as you'd get on a 4K UHD model, but with a 27 inch screen like this, most users will happily use this without any scaling, whereas a 4K UHD model of this kind of size, they would rely on some level of scaling. And needless to say, if you're gaming or doing graphically intensive tasks, this resolution is also quite a bit easier to drive than the 4K UHD resolution. But the pixel density is still decent. It delivers a good level of clarity and detail to suitably high resolution image content and when you're playing games and that kind of thing. So it's not really disappointing in either respect and certainly a good upgrade from the full HD resolution. Something I like to mention early on in the reviews is screen surface. That's because it's something that's very important and it's something which many reviewers don't really talk about in enough detail or don't really talk about at all in some cases. On this model, it has a very light matte anti-glare screen surface. So what that means is the glare handling isn't as good as it is on stronger matte screen surfaces, and I'll show you that shortly. It also means that the image isn't impeded as much, so there's not as much diffusion of light emitted from the monitor either. This gives better clarity and vibrancy potential, so things don't have a smeary look to them when you look at lighter shades. That can happen on some matte screen surfaces. And it doesn't look like there's this kind of a layer of screen surface in front of the image. It has quite a direct emission of light, and I quite like that myself. But you have to remember that the screen surface is a 3D structure, and the surface texture itself can be different regardless of how light the screen surface is. So on this one, it has a bit of kind of misty graininess, as I call it, to lighter shades. It's not a strong or obtrusive graininess, and as I mentioned, it doesn't have a smeary appearance, so most users are going to be just fine with this. I'm not going to talk about the external features of the monitor. So the monitor has a smart home office appearance. It has a dark grey bezel and stand base and stand neck. There's a little sensor unit there, an ambient light sensor, and that allows the monitor to adjust according to the ambient lighting in the room. Whilst the bottom bezel is quite thick and has the OSD controls as well, they're explored along with the light sensor in the OSD video. The top and side bezels have a dual stage design, and that means there's a slim panel border, which is flush with the rest of the screen, and it blends in quite nicely when the monitor's off, as it is now, and there's a slim, hard plastic outer component as well. I always like to mention as well, there are little notches. It looks like a little section of the panel board is missing in the top corners. And that's just used by the machine that puts everything together for calibration purposes of the machine. The screen surface is very light matte anti-glare, so it doesn't offer the same level of glare handling as stronger matte screen surfaces, but it does offer good glare handling still, certainly compared to a glossy monitor. It avoids sharp reflections and that kind of thing. But as I mentioned earlier, and I'll mention a bit later on in the review, it doesn't impede the image as much as stronger matte screen surfaces. From the side, you can see the fairly robust design, and the stand is fully adjustable. So you can tilt the screen backwards and forwards a little bit. You can swivel it left and right. You can adjust the height. And you can also rotate it into portrait. And that's a clockwise rotation into portrait. The exact measurements for these adjustments are given in the written review. At the rear, it's largely that dark grey, or really almost black, matte plastic. There's also a little cable tidy loop here, and that has a satin blue finish, a dark blue finish to it. There's also a carrying handle at the top. The stand attaches using a quick release mechanism, so if you just push that button there, you can 
quickly remove the screen from the stand and that will reveal 100 by 100 millimeter vessel holes for alternative mounting. You can see the little ventilation holes at the top or little holes at the top. The monitor also has two 2 watt speakers which just offer basic sound output, nothing particularly thrilling there, but they're there if you want to use them. The ports face downwards and they include a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, as an HDMI 2.0 port, a display port 1.4 input, and they both support HDR as well as 60 hertz at 2560 by 1440. There's also a USB C input, and this has display port alt mode and also offers 65 watt power delivery. There's then a display port output port, so that's for MST daisy chaining, so multiple monitors connected using one cable to the computer. And then there are some USB 3.1 ports. So the first one there is an upstream, and then there are four USB 3.1 downstream ports. There is an AC power input, so that means that the monitor has an internal power converter rather than having an external power brick. And there's also a K slot. I'm now on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I'm gonna talk about the contrast performance of the monitor. This monitor has an IPS panel, so contrast isn't really its main strength, but there is still some variation between different IPS models and their contrast performance. On this model, I measured a bit above 1000 to one. I believe it was actually 1100 to one using my test settings. So I've certainly seen weaker static contrast on IPS type panels, but this was largely as I was expecting and largely in line with the specifications for the panel. So it doesn't give you a nice inky look to dark shades. It doesn't give you incredible depth or atmosphere or anything like that, especially if you're sitting in a dark room as I am now. There's also IPS glow to consider. So you can see that in particular towards the bottom corners of the screen and particularly the bottom left corner because it has a kind of cool tint. And this gives a sort of hazing which eats away at detail. It is exaggerated a bit in the video, but it certainly is still there to my eye in the dark room like this. And you tend to notice it more towards the bottom because an ergonomically correct viewing position means you'd be a little bit above centre and be looking down slightly, and that tends to cause the bloom to be noticeable towards the bottom rather than the top. On the right side of the screen, it's not so noticeable, especially to, um, especially against this sort of brown woody texture, but there's actually a glow there as well, but it doesn't have a cool tint, instead it has a warm tint. Certainly when you compare the left to the right side of the screen, there is a difference in the colour temperature of the glow. And because of the phosphors used on this model, it does tend to make that a bit more reddish or a bit more orange really compared to what I've seen sometimes. But in general, I find the left side of the screen more noticeable because of the kind of cool bloom. And if you have a unit with bad backlight uniformity or in particular bad dark uniformity, so you've got a lot of backlight bleed or clouding, my unit's not bad in that respect, then it will bring out this IPS glow more strongly. And also if you're using a high brightness level, it'll bring this IPS glow up more strongly or if you're sitting close to the screen. So there are various things that can affect it. The nice thing about IPS type panels like this is the strong color consistency and gamma consistency. And that means that these dark shades, they have decent detail throughout the screen. Yes, there is some loss of detail because of the IPS glow, but overall it has a fairly consistent level of detail for these dark areas. And that is very different to what you get on VA or TN models. So on VA models, you would have a kind of cone in the middle of the screen of, of black crush, where darker shades are darker than they should be, perceived gamma is much higher than it should be. And that masks a lot of detail. Whereas further out on those same VA models, particularly towards the bottom and the extreme edges of the screen, you get things looking really the reverse, not masked enough. And that can bring out some detail which the developers don't really intend you to see. And this is more noticeable if you're looking at heavily compressed content, streamed content, Netflix, that kind of thing, uh, YouTube as well. They have so-called compression artifacts and they should be quite blended. And on this screen, they are quite blended. But if you've got the perceived gamma being far too low at some section of the screen, it brings it out too strongly. This is even more noticeable on TN models. Towards the top of the screen, they're really blended. And for example, the texture on this door here would be really quite, well not invisible, but, but really a lot more masked than it is here. Whereas towards the bottom of the screen, it would look kind of flooded and it would have too much detail. And again, these compression artifacts, if they're there, they would be quite obvious and it can give a banded or blocky appearance in places. On this, you avoid that. So there certainly are strengths to IPS type panels like this. As I mentioned, the screen surface 
very light matte anti-glare so it doesn't have a strong graininess just a little bit of a, a misty graininess and doesn't have a smeary or layered appearance so these brighter elements look smoother than they do on some matte screen surfaces and it's just nice not having a kind of layered appearance in front of the image as well I'm now on Legom, legom.nl, the website, and the tests for viewing angles. The Legom text, it appears largely a blended grey throughout the screen, which is really how it should appear. There's a slight green tint to the striping of the text, but it's only slight. It doesn't have a strong saturated green look, and it doesn't have a strong saturated red look elsewhere. And that's what you'd get on TN models and VA models. And it doesn't shift if you move your head either. So it's nice and consistent. And that reflects a good low viewing angle dependency to the gamma curve of the monitor. If you look at solid colors, for example, this purple block, it appears a good violet shade throughout, fairly vibrant actually. It has slightly more of a pink hue at the very edges. And that's kind of quite normal on models which have a dual stage bezel like this, just at the very edges, slightly more of a pink hue. But elsewhere, it's pretty consistent and this doesn't always come across properly on the video. Sometimes the video can make it look like it looks different in the middle of the screen, but really it, to the eye, it's very consistent aside from at the very edges. And this is very different to what you'd see on TN models where you'd have an obvious gradient from top where it looks kind of a deep purple shade and it becomes kind of violet and then more of a pink hue towards the bottom, a very strong pink hue. And VA models, you can have shifts as well comparing the center to the edge of the screen, which are more pronounced than you get here. The red shade, good vibrant red throughout, nice vivid red, really solid, no complaints at all here. Same with the green shade, it is a saturated green chartreuse shade throughout, and it has a bit of a yellowish hue, more of a yellow hue than it would on models with more extension in the colour gamut in this region, but that's not really anything to do with colour consistency, that's really a separate issue. And by the same token, some models make this look more of a yellow green hue. So this one, it looks largely as it should really, and it's nice and consistent throughout the screen. The blue block, a good royal blue shade throughout, no complaints here. I'm now on Battlefield 5 and I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using some in-game examples. This monitor has a colour gamut which extends a bit beyond sRGB, but more so in some regions than others. And it's particularly for the red shade that it extends more beyond sRGB. And for content like this, I'm running the game in SDR at the moment, it's designed with the sRGB colour space in mind, so if you have extension beyond that with the monitor's gamut, then you do get extra saturation. And in general, it gives a more vibrant appearance, but it does kind of overblow some shades, or it can overblow some shades and make them appear noticeably more saturated than they should appear. But this is quite different to if you just increase saturation digitally, so you use the saturation control in the monitor's OSD, or if you use NVIDIA's digital vibrance control or something like that. So what digital saturation controls like that do, they pull shades close to the edge of the gamut without expanding the gamut itself. So the most saturated shades are exactly the same, whereas the ones that are a bit less saturated than that become more saturated than they should and things are crushed together. You lose shade variety and it gives a very cartoonish look to things, especially with extreme adjustments. On this, you don't get that. It's more of a natural boost in saturation. But as I said, the reds really are pushed further in the gamut. So for these autumnal colors, they look a bit too reddish and there are some woody tones as well, which don't look as neutral as they should. So they have a bit of a red push, but it's not extreme. I've certainly seen models with more extension in the red region of the gamut and they really push things to more of an extreme. As you can imagine, this scene is actually very good for highlighting the extension in the reds in the gamut. This fire here, very convenient, very uh, nice warm look to it, very vibrant, but some of the oranges verge too much on red, some of the yellows a bit too much on orange, um, but the shade variety is still maintained, so you get a nice array of yellows and oranges and reds. It just looks a little bit overdone, but some people will quite like that. It certainly has a vibrant look and it's quite eye-catching. The nice thing about the gamut on this model is that the greens don't extend so much. There's a bit of extension in some regions, in the, in the green to red region, but the extension overall for the green shade isn't as much as it could be. So I actually measured 85% DCI-P3 colour space. The reds correspond very closely to DCI-P3 for the colour gamut, but the greens, they actually stick closer to sRGB than DCI-P3. So this means that the, the greens actually look quite natural. 
Some of the greens, some of the deep greens aren't as lush as they could be on models with a wider color gamut. But then again, you can have some bad effects with that as well because some of the greens that have quite a strong yellow hue, you don't get them on this scene in particular, but there are some greens on this game and other games which have more of a yellowish hue and that can be brought out really strongly and it can look quite neon and quite artificial, those kind of shades. On this model, you don't get that. So things actually look more natural in that respect. So it's quite an interesting gamut, a bit different to models I've looked at recently, even wide gamut models, but it's quite interesting. And I think it's a look that many users will quite like. It's not for everyone though. And of course the shade representation can be affected not just by the color gamut, but the gamma setting you're using. This monitor has different gamma settings. It's worth being aware that my unit actually had gamma which was a little bit higher than 2.2 or a little bit lower depending on which setting you were using. It wasn't possible to get perfect 2.2 gamma tracking on my unit using any OSD settings. I have to say that was a bit disappointing actually given that this monitor is one of their designer monitors and a strong factory calibration is really part of the marketing for this. So I'm afraid you can't always rely on that. And in my case, it wasn't really to be. I think most units probably do have better gamma calibration than mine, and mine wasn't far off. It just means that some shades look a little bit deeper than they should. This is explored more in the written review. It's not something I'm gonna bang on about too much, because as I said, there is difference between units there, and it's not an extreme issue. But if you are looking for really strong color accuracy, then you do have to be aware of this. But really, for the best results, you wanna profile the monitor with your own colorimeter or spectrophotometer. That's something I'd say on any monitor, regardless of how good the gamma might seem to be out of the box anyway. But speaking of out of the box and what you can do in the OSD, there's also an sRGB emulation setting. So if you go into the menu and... <laughs> I was reaching for a joystick there. There isn't a joystick on this one. They're just pressable buttons at the bottom there. And then go to and then go to picture advanced picture mode, Rec 709 and sRGB. They're both sRGB emulation settings, and that's explored in the written review. I'm just going to use sRGB because it's a bit brighter and I find it a bit better balanced overall. The gamma is also a bit less extreme. So this tones down the color gamut, so it corresponds closely to sRGB, very closely to sRGB. So those, the brown shades now look more appropriate. It doesn't look as vibrant, but it really kind of looks more as the developers intend, and it gets rid of that strong red cast to some of the neutral browns, so they look more neutral, more woody. And the fire is toned down as well. It doesn't have the same kind of saturation levels, especially to the deep oranges. They don't look as deep and don't verge on red and that kind of thing. So yes, it does look more accurate. You are restricted with the sRGB setting. You can't change the gamma, for example, but you can change the brightness at least. So it's not as restrictive as some sRGB modes. So if you prefer a more natural look to things more as the developers intend, then certainly this can be a nice mode to use. I'm now back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I've got the monitor running in HDR. So this monitor does support HDR. It responds to HDR10 content, but it's only very basic HDR support. It doesn't even have the VESA Display HDR400 certification, which is the lowest level that VESA will certify for. So when you're running the monitor under HDR, there's very little you can actually change in the OSD in terms of the image setup. So it automatically goes into its HDR picture mode and that's the only one available. You can't change things like the color balance, so the color channels. You can't change the brightness, that's automatically set for you. Although you can change the sharpness. So this is actually set to seven by default, and it's quite normal for monitors under HDR to have an over sharpening, a sharpness filter applied. I prefer setting this to seven because it's a neutral sharpness. It's the same as it appears under SDR. And on this model, I don't really feel that over sharpening adds anything to the image. Sometimes it can help on HDR models to accentuate some of the advantages that I'm gonna talk about with HDR. But on this model, it doesn't really have the contrast advantage, as I'll cover, to really have any benefits from the sharpness filter. But ultimately, it's something which is very subjective. And it's nice that you get the control over this filter on this model, so you can take it or leave it or you can increase it or decrease it, depending on your preferences. So, as I mentioned, very basic HDR support. The main reason for that is that you gain no contrast advantage whatsoever. 
by running the monitor under HDR. And you'll be able to see in the video, strong IPS glow. It is exaggerated quite a bit by the camera, but even so, I can see it to my eye quite clearly. There's a kind of flooded look. And the reason for that is it's basically just like running the monitor with a high brightness setting under SDR. You don't even gain any extra brightness, but you just have the whole backlight acting as one unit. There's no local dimming. And that means that it can't account for intricate mixtures of light and dark. There is a dynamic contrast element and it's an enhanced dynamic contrast, which means that it responds to metadata from the HDR content. So it can control itself with a bit more precision than a normal dynamic contrast setting would. But either way, it's still just a dynamic contrast setting. You're not getting local dimming, you're not getting a boost in contrast, and you're not getting really strong HDR luminance levels anyway. So basically, your dark elements don't look particularly deep or atmospheric. Your bright elements don't really stand out with great pop. Things, as I said, really just look as they do under SDR with high brightness. So why would you want to use this setting? Well, there are some advantages. One thing is that it allows a 10-bit color signal to be used that is used under HDR, whereas when gaming under SDR and most SDR content in general, you just have eight bits per channel. And this increases the nuanced shade variety when you have this 10-bit color signal. So the darker shades, as I mentioned, there's no local dimming. So really the shadowy details there should be a lot deeper than they are and the bright elements next to them much brighter, and the even brighter elements there should really stand out and pop. You don't get that at all on this model, but at least you do get an enhanced nuanced shade variety, and it does make the shadowy areas look a bit more believable, a bit more realistic. And it also affects shades at the upper end, and actually it's, it affects all shades, but it's just generally more noticeable at the lower end, as I mentioned there, but also the upper end. So the mist here, and the rays of light. On the camera, it just appears like a big ball of light. On the video, it just appears like a big ball of light. But actually, there's a good nuanced shade variety there. There's some really very bright shades and less bright shades, all together with nice smooth gradients. So that is something which is really enhanced by HDR. And again, the shadowy details around the vegetation there improved by the 10-bit precision. Although, again, local dimming would really help here. And also these very bright elements, they just don't stand out in that beautiful HDR way like you get on some models. The glint on the water there as well is pretty unimpressive. It's not dim by any means, it's still reasonably bright, but just not by HDR standards. Now the monitor's 10-bit precision. The, the monitor itself actually uses 8 bits per channel, so the panel only supports 8-bit. At least it does according to all the specifications I've seen, and it seems to be the case, but it's a little bit curious because even under SDR, you can actually select 10-bit in the driver or 12-bit if you're using HDMI. And this is a bit weird. And I think, as far as I can see, it's because the monitor is set up to allow a dithering stage to be used on the GPU. So if you select 10-bit or 12-bit in the graphics driver, then it can allow a dithering stage to be used by the GPU. But this is only really relevant if you're actually viewing 10-bit or 12-bit content. So for HDR10, which is the pipeline that's used here, it's 10-bit, which is used. So HDMI with its 12-bit support and DisplayPort with its 10-bit support, they look exactly the same, um, or certainly to my eye they did. I didn't have a side-by-side -side comparison or anything like that, but I certainly used both for quite some time and I didn't notice any clear differences. Another thing is that, yes, ideally you would have the monitor itself, doing this 10-bit processing, everything on the monitor, without GPU dithering. But in practice, it actually makes very little difference to the end result. I've tested this on various monitors which have a 10-bit color signal on the monitor completely, with some refresh rates or resolutions, and the same monitor running using GPU dithering, if you set to a higher refresh rate or higher resolution. And I've looked at specific content, and really, the GPU dithering does a very good job under HDR. Things are very carefully controlled, the processing and everything, and really the end result is very similar. The other aspect of HDR is that the DCI-P3 color space is now targeted, and that's the near-term sort of goal for HDR, really. And this monitor has 85% DCI-P3 coverage. So these green shades there, they don't look as lush as they could, and as I've seen on some HDR models, but they don't look washed out by any means. They look fairly vibrant, 
um, but certainly stronger DCI-P3 extension here would help them look a bit lusher. And also Lara, although you can't see it on these scenes, she's not wearing one of her beautiful dresses here. She has some very nice ornate dresses with some really nice deep purple shades and really nice silky royal blues. And those shades don't look as pure and as deep as I've seen on some HDR models. It's nothing to do with the contrast, although the contrast can help in this respect, but it's more the, the colour gamut just doesn't have the coverage in those regions to really bring out those shades in such a beautiful way. However, as I mentioned earlier, the red elements of the gamut do extend more. So under SDR, I had this sort of less neutral look to some woody tones and also skin tones, although I didn't mention it on Battlefield 5 because it wasn't really relevant in the scene I was showing you. Lara's skin tone here, under SDR, it looks slightly too tanned and really it looks more reddish than it should. Under HDR, that's toned down and it looks more as it should. Her hair as well, too reddish under SDR, but now it looks more appropriate. Whereas if you look at fires and some of the richer red hues, they really make good use of the DCI P3 colour space and they look really nice and vibrant. So the colour gamut is more appropriate for HDR, but it does miss out in some elements. So it's, you know, it's not perfect in that respect, although it kind of does, I suppose, look a bit more accurate under HDR than under SDR overall. Ideally, you'd have better coverage, you'd have local dimming, you'd have much better contrast. So this is far from a full fat HDR experience, but there are still some benefits to be had. I'm now on Battlefield 5 again, and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. There's an article on the website all about responsiveness, and this covers a very important topic called perceived blur. So there are two main contributors to this on a monitor. One is the movement of your eyes as you track motion on the screen, and the other is pixel responsiveness. But it's actually this first element of perceived blur which is dominant on modern monitors like this and it's something that's closely tied to refresh rate so when you've got a 60 hertz monitor like this and I've got the game running at 60 frames a second so I'm getting the most out of this monitor in terms of responsiveness it means that you get a moderate amount of perceived blur due to eye movement your eyes spend a lot of time tracking the motion on the screen they're spending a lot of time moving and this generates a lot of blur and then again that's all explored in this article and it's also summarized in the written review this element's exactly the same on a much faster 60 hertz monitor than this so say a really well-tuned TN model running at 60 hertz, for example, would have much faster pixel responses, but you're still going to get this kind of mask of perceived blur. So overall, this is definitely the dominant factor. And this 60 hertz experience also really limits the connected feel. So that is the fluidity, the precision you feel when you're interacting with the game world. It's not the same as you get on higher refresh rate monitors running at a higher frame rate. But in terms of connected feel, another important aspect is input lag. And this monitor had a little bit under five milliseconds. That's what I recorded. So a fairly low level of input lag, and this shouldn't bother most users at all. In terms of the pixel responsiveness, there are some weaknesses, but overall, the pixel transitions are performed fast enough for a good 60 hertz experience. So there's not really anything that really stands out as a clear weakness. For these shades here, it's mainly medium and lighter shades. The transitions are performed fast enough to either provide no additional trailing, so no additional perceived blur on top of what you see due to your eye movement anyway, but there is a little bit in places, a bit of powdery trailing, as I like to call it. There's more of that for the darker transitions, and I'm going to show you some of them with a different scenario shortly. So, so you can see up there, for example, there's a nice dark brick with a medium to bright sky in the background. And this creates a bit of this, what I call powdery trailing, but it's not smeary, so it doesn't kind of extend out quite far from the object and create this kind of smoke-like effect as you can get on your typical VA model. There's a bit of overshoot as well, inverse ghosting, but that's really only a very slight thing. It, it really doesn't catch the eye at all on this model. So there's a little bit of halo trailing in verse ghosting, and that is brighter than the background or object color. That's what halo trailing is to the left of this object there, for example. And it's probably not going to come across in an obvious way on the video because it really it's not obvious and it's not eye catching at all. And that's really the more obvious example of this. There's nothing that really stands out in the way of overshoot. 
I'm now on a different scene on Battlefield 5. This one has more dark transitions or dark shades. These are the kind of transitions which VA models will really struggle with. Then you get smeary trailing, obvious powdery trailing, which is really extended quite far behind the object. IPS models like this, they do sometimes have some weaknesses um, in terms of what I'd call perhaps heavy powdery trailing or just more obvious powdery trailing than you'd get with the lighter shades involved in the transition. And this one's no exception in that respect, but really there's nothing that stands out in a clear and obvious way. So the boats down there, for example, there's a little bit of an extra powdery trail behind them and around them during movement. But again, nothing smeary. The makeshift roof here as well. There's just a little bit of powdery trailing behind that. If you want a more representative example of this, then check out the pursuit photographs in the review because they capture this quite nicely, this kind of thing. But it's really nothing extreme. And again, there's a little bit of overshoot as well to the left of the objects when I move to the right. It's a little bit of slightly colorful overshoot actually, but nothing particularly eye-catching. The same here around the tree trunk, just a little bit of overshoot. But in terms of the, the weaknesses here, they're really just slight weaknesses. I just like to be complete and just point them out that they are there, but really nothing that you should worry about. This monitor doesn't support adaptive sync, so there's no variable refresh rate technology. That means that you have a static 60 hertz refresh rate. It doesn't vary with the frame rate of the content. And just to round off, if you do want to completely get rid of any of this powdery trailing, even though it isn't extreme by any means on this model, then there is an option. So I'm using AMA, Advanced Motion Acceleration, set to high at the moment. That is clearly the optimal setting to my eye. But if you want, go into the picture section of the menu, AMA, set that to premium. And what that does is it gets rid of the powdery trailing, but instead, it puts this extreme overshoot, which is going to look like some crazy disco going on in the video. So I think you'd have to be a bit of a psychopath to actually enjoy this kind of look to the image, even if it does get rid of that slight powdery trailing. I guess if you want a supreme competitive edge, then you could argue that this is slightly better. It does give you slightly lower perceived blur overall. But honestly, I think that this is a lot more distracting than the slight powdery trailing, which is the alternative. To wrap up then, the monitor is solidly built. It has a smart home office appearance, quite an unfussy design really. It does have a little light sensor beneath the BenQ logo there, but that is not a feature which I found much practical useful. And that's because it is a one size fits all approach that they use here. You can't adjust the brightness. It does everything itself. You can't say that I want to limit the brightness to this, or for my eyes, I prefer this kind of brightness and this kind of ambient lighting condition. So that kind of approach is completely flawed in my view, and it's quite a common approach taken on monitors that have ambient light sensors. And for that reason, I don't find them particularly useful. More useful was the ergonomic flexibility, the fully adjustable stand, that's a nice thing to have. The use of matte plastics as well, kind of dark gray for most of the plastics, practically black. The 2560 by 1440 WQHD resolution, a good comfortable pixel density, good amount of desktop real estate, decent level of clarity and detail to suitably high resolution content as well. Works quite nicely for 27 inch screen in my view. The contrast performance, largely as I expected for the panel type. So following the adjustments made to my test settings, still a bit above 1000 to one, but not dramatically so. IPS glow, certainly a feature and this created a moderate bloom towards the bottom of the screen, particularly towards the bottom left corner where it had a cooler tint to it. But the strength of the IPS type panel were also clear in terms of the gamma consistency. So IPS glow aside, the detail levels were good, nice and consistent throughout the screen. You didn't get the kind of masking of detail or excessive details at different points of the screen as you would get with other panel types. The screen surface, very light matte anti-glare. I found this quite agreeable overall. The surface texture was a touch grainier than I'd like, but I'm very sensitive to this and it wasn't by any means extremely grainy and it didn't have a layered or smeary appearance to it and it did have a nice direct emission of light thanks to the very light matte anti-glare screen surface. So I certainly appreciated that aspect of it. The colour reproduction, really the main 
talking point of this monitor, the main strength of IPS type panels in general. This one had a little bit of extension beyond sRGB that was mainly in the red region of the gamut. So this meant that some shades appeared a bit more saturated, more vibrant if you're not in a color managed application and you haven't profiled the monitor properly. So games, for example, and just browsing around on the desktop. But if you want to curtail that and you don't have a color emitter, you haven't profiled the monitor, you're not using color aware applications, whatever it may be, then there is an sRGB emulation mode and that worked well. But for general purpose use and just talking about the native gamut, the extra saturation in the reds, it uh, gave kind of extra vibrancy. Some users will quite like this, but the fact that the greens stuck quite close to sRGB, certainly most of the green shades, at least most of the green region of the gamut and the blues as well, it meant that there wasn't the kind of strange unnatural look to elements of the environment on games and, and other content where it can kind of bring out yellow shades in an obvious way. So that was nice to have that kind of uh, more natural look in that respect. A key aspect of this monitor is the fact that it is factory calibrated and that's something which is quite heavily marketed on this model. Unfortunately, my unit wasn't actually that well calibrated. It wasn't badly calibrated, but it certainly didn't have an amazing level of factory calibration. The main issue was the gamma. The gamma was just out of whack. And regardless of what I did in the OSD, it wasn't possible to get that completely tracking the 2.2 curve normally. So it's kind of a bit of a shame. I know people like to have the reassurance that this model is going to be one that they can just plug in. They don't need their own color emitter. They're going to get really good gamma handling and other aspects of the image are going to be good. So it was an unfortunate thing to have my unit not particularly amazing in that respect. But my expectation is that most units would have better gamma handling than this. I was actually quite surprised. I've used quite a few BenQ monitors and not specifically for their designer series, but just in general, even their gaming monitors, um, so certainly not the XL series, but the EW series and the EX series, their entertainment monitors, if you like, they tend to have actually very good gamma handling and they don't really tout this great level of factory calibration. So it was certainly a bit of a disappointing aspect to see that not particularly tightly controlled on my unit. The monitor also supports HDR. I use the term supports quite loosely. It will react to HDR10 content, but it doesn't have local dimming. It doesn't have a particularly powerful backlight and the color gamut only covers 85% of the DCI-P3 color space. So it doesn't even do enough for the lowest level of VESA Display HDR certification. So it's just a very basic HDR output that it gives you. It does allow 10-bit color processing to be used in the pipeline, and that does improve the nuanced shade variety. And the gamut is put to good use, even though it is only 85% DCI-P3. So the extension of the reds, that's curtailed, and you don't get the oversaturation of skin tones and sort of woody tones looking too red, and that kind of thing. So that's toned down nicely, but you do get some nice vibrant red elements, which are clearly well beyond the sRGB color space. So fires, for example, have some really warm orange tones, which are more saturated than you'd see within the sRGB color space. But for other elements, some greens aren't as lush as I've seen, some blues and purples, that kind of thing. So it's sort of a mixed HDR experience and really far from a full fat HDR experience. The responsiveness of the monitor for a 60 hertz monitor like this, largely quite decent. It's had good low level of input lag. The pixel response tuning was quite good. Only a little bit of overshoot and thing particularly eye catching. There was some powdery trailing where darker transitions were involved, so where darker shades were displayed, but nothing out of the ordinary for an IPS type panel and certainly nothing that would approach smeary trailing like you'd get on your typical VA model. The 60 hertz refresh rate in general, that's actually something that manufacturers are tending to move away from. Of course, you can get much higher refresh rate models and they're generally quite different to this in terms of their market position and that kind of thing. But even so, a lot of manufacturers are moving away from 60 hertz to 75 hertz as their kind of lower refresh rate. This model doesn't support that and I wasn't able to overclock it or anything like that uh, without obvious frame skipping. Of course, mileage may vary between units, but this isn't something I generally advise on a monitor which clearly isn't comfortable running there. So if you look at alternatives, you could look at something like the ASUS PA278QV. That offers a 75 hertz refresh rate. It also has adaptive sync variable refresh rate technology, which this model doesn't have. So if you're interested in those kind of features and 
you want a at least supposed good factory calibration. It's not a monitor I've tested myself, but I have had some good positive user feedback about it. Definitely consider it. It's also somewhat cheaper than this model. So it should certainly be on your radar. I don't have enough data to fully endorse the product and I don't generally like fully endorsing products unless there's a lot of data or I've tested them myself. So there is that, but I, I would, I'd still definitely look into it. And especially if you're interested in a monitor that's kind of like this, but supports 75 Hertz and has adaptive sync on the side as well. There's also the Dell U2719D, which you can overclock to run at 75 Hertz. Mileage again may vary. Really, the, the capability of that monitor is a little bit different to this. The color gamut's not quite as wide. The screen surface is not as light, but I have a lot of data on that and I've tested it myself and the factory calibration is usually very solid. So that's really all of us too. The BenQ PD2705Q. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how I can support the work that we do.